I've got a, a, a expert panel right here, and I can tell you everywhere I go around the world, this is a conversation that almost every customer wants to have. And the reason is quite simple. It's because when you look at what most economies around the, the world still want, is they want jobs, they want innovation, they want economic development, and they're looking for the tools and the techniques that they can employ to help stimulate those things. And I'm extremely excited and very pleased that Amazon has been able to partner with some of the best organizations in the world who are delivering these kinds of new economic models uh, to be able to help citizens, to be able to create jobs, to be able to bring skills into the 21st century, and to really change uh, the way that, that people's lives um, have the opportunity to deliver potential. And so I'm going to start off by introducing uh, each member of our panel up here. Um, and then we have a, a couple of questions that we thought were interesting and intriguing. But as I said, uh, as we get the conversation rolling, please ask us those questions that you're interested in. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do before I get started, just get a quick show of hands. How many people do we have from uh, government? All right, good, about a quarter of the audience. How many people do we have that are uh, in, in uh, AWS partner ecosystem? All right, there you go, about a third of the audience. And how many people do we have that are interested in learning about economic development, maybe come from uh, some other non-governmental organization? All right, good. Uh, I think this is going to be a great conversation, and this allows everybody here to kind of uh, tune some of their remarks. So let me start off by introducing immediately to my left here, uh, Sheldon Hemmelfarb. He is the CEO of Peace Tech Labs. Uh, Sheldon is uh, also the president. Uh, Peace Tech Labs operates out of the U.S. Institute of Peace. And their goal, quite simply, is to further advance uh, USIP's work at the intersection of technology, media, and data to help reduce violent conflict all over the world. Uh, in addition to that important job, Sheldon's also an award-winning filmmaker, a former commentator for the National Public Radio, and author of numerous articles on politics, uh, popular culture, and conflict. Uh, and by the way, just as a side note, uh, if you ever have the opportunity to partner with Peace Tech Labs or with the Peace Tech Scalarator, I highly encourage it. They've got an awesome facility, uh, and they shared it with us last night for uh, one of our receptions. Uh, it's a fantastic place to collaborate, and you'll probably see that's kind of a theme here through the, uh, through the panelists we have. Uh, next up is Sean Griffin. He's the founder of GriffinWorks.org. Sean's the CEO and the founder uh, of GriffinWorks and also the co-founder of Recreate, We Create. So Griffin Works and We Create develop and implement entrepreneurship programming in over 60 countries and have worked with over 100,000 entrepreneurs since 2012. Uh, Sean's a Silicon Valley serial entrepreneur turned international entrepreneurial program designer and ecosystem builder. And most recently, AWS teamed up with Sean and Griffin Works in April to do something that was really uh, exciting and interesting. It was called the Extreme Build a Business Workshop. Uh, with over 100 op entrepreneurs joining that workshop in Costa Rica. And it just, it, I think it's that indication of just how much enthusiasm there is for figuring out how to use uh, tech to create uh, new industries, new jobs, and uh, new businesses. Um, then immediately to uh, Sean's left is Kate Goodall. She's the CEO of Halicon, uh, Halcyon, pardon me, and she's a recovering maritime archaeologist. I'm not quite sure exactly what that is, and we will probably find out, um, but she's currently CEO of Halcyon. At, they're based in Washington, D.C. Uh, I've been over to their offices as well. They do a great job of creating an environment uh, to incubate um, programs uh, by providing the advocacy, the support, a phenomenal facility, housing, and all of that type of programming that encourages social entrepreneurs to learn, to be able to experiment, we talk a lot about that, sometimes fail, be able to recover fast and advance their talents and their visions. Uh, Kate also leads DC's Innovation and Technology Inclusion Council, working with fellow members on ways to grow the city's innovation and technology economy uh, in an inclusive manner. And then uh, finally here, but certainly not least, is Andre Pinar. He is the founder of C5. Um, he's a special, uh, C5 is a specialist investor group that focuses on cybersecurity, big data, and cloud computing. Uh, Andre has built, previously built a company called G3, which was a global cybersecurity consulting firm. Uh, he's a lawyer by training, uh, and he is uh, also the driving force behind several different 
uh, accelerators and scalerators around the world. One that I was fortunate to work with, Andre and the C5 team uh, in Bahrain, which is generating great results. Um, and then more recently in partnering with Peace Tech Labs to be able to launch the Peace Tech Accelerator that's housed at USIP. Uh, and this grooms startups who are working on solutions that foster peace and social cohesion. Um, so with that introduction, um, I would like to be able to start with a couple of questions, and I think I'm going to start with Kate. Uh, what exactly is a uh, recovering maritime archaeologist? <laughs> this is slightly off topic, but I promise we'll get there. No, it's actually, it's a little bit relevant, actually, because, um, so I spent about four years diving on shipwrecks, mapping shipwrecks, and uh, I will say that the transferable skill set, because it, it's not easy to see how that maps out to what I'm doing now, uh, the transferable skill set is that you learn not to panic. When you're 100 feet below the surface and something goes wrong, you can't panic. You have to assess. You have to count to three. <laughs> Remember to breathe, and uh, if you can breathe, and uh, and then figure it out. Uh, and I would say that when you're running an organization, the only thing that will kill you is panic. Right? You've got to learn to take a step back, take a walk. And certainly, it's one of the things that we tell all of our startups is to sort of keep that perspective and to stay calm. S stay calm, breathe, <laughs> reassess, and then keep going, exactly. and do it and do it without uh, la allowing it to slow you down or ruffle your feathers. Well, that is a good transition um, because there are many places around the world where they're trying to drive public-private par partnership models. Um, and they're trying to tackle important problems. They're trying to use them to build community. They're trying to use those to build the bridge between government and industry. Um, but not all of them work out well. And so one of the questions that uh, we had was, what exactly is a good approach for building a solid public-private partnership? What works and what do you avoid? Yeah, so when we created Halcyon, one of our uh, chief theses actually was that for social entrepreneurs, those that are trying to build businesses that prioritize profit and impact equally, that being in Washington, D.C. was a really good thing. Um, m many people wouldn't necessarily think of government as the most innovative uh, uh, entity, but um, our thesis, I think, paid off. We thought that being in DC meant that we would be able to use government's expertise and advice to help our, fe our fellows. Um, we thought that they would be a great partner for convenings. We thought they might be able to provide some risk capital with some of their grants. And certainly, the, the big strategy is that ultimately, many of the um, uh, international government organizations and federal government and state governments might be great exit strategies for some of our entrepreneurs' so, uh, solutions. Um, we haven't quite gotten to that end point yet for the last one because we take very early stage social entrepreneurs, so that some of them are getting there, and I can see that still um, very clearly. But, uh, and I would say when it comes to providing risk capital, there's pros and cons, right? right? Government isn't nimble and many, of, many government entities are not nimble. So in order to move as fast as the entrepreneurs need, uh, that can be a challenge. Certainly, I know many people in the World Bank that would love to be able to do startup funding, but it's tricky. However, USAID, SBIR programs, there are, there are some opportunities there. But that's where I would argue that uh, you know, the private sector really needs to step up. Philanthropy needs to get better about thinking about how they function as risk capital, not safety capital, not proven, not you know none of this. Just really diving in where it's most needed and where it can be most impactful. And certainly, venture capitalists do that all the time. Uh, and then, lastly, in terms of the uh, the expertise, we've had some of our best mentors and advisors come out of uh, you know the public sector because their networks are just so profound. Um, and then you also have great examples of how the government can be a good convener. So um, the Global Entrepreneurship Summit, the GIST program at the State Department, they can really leverage that power of like pulling all of these great entrepreneurs and these great partners together in one space like no one else can. What, what would you say you have to watch out for in the uh, private, in structuring the private-public partnership? What we have to watch out for? Yeah. I think, you know, with any partnership, it's about setting expectations from the beginning and about a healthy uh, communication. Um, you know, I think that uh, uh, one of the pitfalls of working with the public sector is that, um, you know, that you may start off with a relationship in one area that doesn't then uh, continue all the way through to the top. Um, so you really do need to structure it carefully from the beginning and make sure that you're you're matching up on different levels and communicating well 
I, th I think that's a very important uh, point to make. Um, it's easy to want to move fast. It's easy to want to uh, embrace some of these concepts. But unless you do have that executive commitment and, and alignment from the top, some projects just work out to be good intentions. Uh, and I know sometimes it's very tough uh, when you're trying to put these partnerships together. Uh, it's not just always smooth. And having that understanding and alignment and co executive commitment is important. Uh, you mentioned another thing that's interesting, and that's the importance of bringing capital in when you're doing these projects. And I'd like to just direct a brief question to Andre, because I know one of the tenants of the Scalarator in Bahrain that you started up was also access uh, to capital, to be able to, to take those startup ideas and give them legs and let them, uh, let them blossom. Can you talk a little bit about how you have built that unique combination? Max, yes. Um, I think the, the theme of this panel discussion is, is one of the key questions and one of the key challenges with which governments all around the world are grappling. How do we create new models to, to include people into the digital economy? How do we innovate new models to, to drive economic development and create jobs? And we see the extent of this challenge in the election results around the world uh, where people come out with very strong protest vo votes because they feel excluded by the digital economy. So this is a theme of, of great importance for, for governments, for businesses, businesses and not-for-profits. And with cloud computing disrupting the, the technology sector, it's very important that we innovate all the related models, not just the digital models, not only how we architect our, uh, our ICT infrastructure, but also how we create new models for, uh, for businesses and new models for, for job creation. And in this regard, I think cloud creates a tremendous opportunity. Today, more than 90% of all startups in the US get born on the AWS cloud. More than 70% of all startups get born uh, in France on the AWS cloud and in Europe. So for the first time, we have an opportunity to displace capital with technology and mentorship. And this is really the opportunity that we are grasping in our accelerators, um, helping startups that have been born on the cloud to scale and grow faster without needing the same intensive amount of capital that they would have required before cloud existed um, to grow to the next level. But having said that, capital still remains one of the key ingredients for growth. And so getting access to capital is very important. And we tackle that challenge in two ways. One, very generously from our partner, AWS, in the form of cloud credits, which today is one of the most valuable currencies in the world because you not only get a return on your investment in the form of um, a dollar for dollar spending, but you also get an innovation return on how you apply those cloud credits. And then secondly, by building a community of investors, and you've got to do that locally, who really are committed to helping to build these new models. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to take one thing that you said and turn the question over to Sean briefly. You know, you talked about how technology can help create jobs. Um, sometimes, though, there are complaints that technology is leading to more automation and fewer jobs. Um, in what ways do you see uh, technology continuing to be a bigger driver and contributing to job development? And how do you answer those concerns that embracing technology is going to lose, lead to a loss of jobs. Right. I mean, statistically, it is. There's, there's less, it takes less with automation, uh, AI, and different uh, models that are coming out. It, you don't need as many people to work within the company, and then there's specialized skills that are associated with that. Um, so here's a statistic that I think is really important to understand. Globally, less than 1% of all businesses receive any kind of traditional funding. So it's, it's critical to understand funding is not, it's, it's very limited who is going to receive that funding. And then two, less than 2%, maybe it's 2%, of all businesses that are starting up are technology at the core of their business model. So I don't, I'd be interested in understanding your 70%, but less than 2%. But yet 98% of the programs that support entrepreneurs are focused on the 2%. And that's why you have such an abundance of similar businesses and chasing money and, and people trying to go all around the world to find business opportunities. So what we see uh, is one, it's not about funding, it's about creating revenue. 
and that revenue is the focus to help drive a business forward. Um, with that 98% of businesses that are starting up or building that are non-tech, it's how to integrate technology into those businesses to help make them more competitive. If we really want to grow jobs globally, there are three places that that's going to happen. Agriculture, manufacturing, and um, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot the third one. But uh, health. It, health, thank you. Uh, that's, where, that's where jobs are at, and that's where jobs will be created. There's opportunities to innovate within those. Uh, spaces and and when we when we start thinking about growing business and innovation, uh, we have to be thinking about we're starting a new SME challenge uh, project in Pakistan, working with existing businesses and the whole program is around integrating technology to help grow those businesses. Whether that's somebody shoes, you know, that they're very good in fashion and and, and leathers uh, that or gems and jewels even, right? There's opportunities within that that we need to be thinking about and, and how do we drive that. And then coming back to this public policy piece, we need to help political leaders understand how to make better decisions around how to support business builders and entrepreneurs because you have too many times and too many situations I can name politicians who are making decisions that have no relevance to help support the entrepreneur or the business person, in fact, could be working against them. Um, it's done because they can profile something that gives them more votes and that type of uh, you know, reality in, in the situation. But politicians and political leaders who are creating policy need a lot more education about what is really needed at the business building level. Uh, well, I, I've seen that myself firsthand because the old models of driving economic development might have been exclusively based on pulling levers that the government control. Right. And I think that's one of the keys with the projects that everybody here is working on, is the government can't, by themselves, pull the right levers and make things happen. It does take this public-private partnership, whether it's through scalar raters, whether it's through uh, introducing not just mentorship, but also introducing early stage funding. I think it does, it's clear it takes something different. And, and Sheldon is working with uh, an entirely um, uh, different model to try and encourage entrepreneurship to address uh, peace and social issues. And so in that particular instance, it's not, it's not the um, tech per se that is at all at the center of what he's doing. It's an important enabler. Uh, and so one of the things I was interested in is what are the new ways that you see uh, technology being used to help drive uh, peace? Well, first, let's just all agree that peace is closely correlated with economic development. Local sustainable economies are absolutely critical. And yet, I've been doing this work for the sad to say, the better part of three decades, back before the Great War, and that has been lost in a lot of the conversation. It's about how can we react to the latest outbreak of violence, how can we dampen down the violence to save lives, all necessary things. But that piece about create the intersection between peace building and sustainable economies gets lost all too often. And thanks to tech, we actually have a really great opportunity now to start a whole new conversation about that. And I see it all the time. Let me give you a couple of examples, just from the refugee camps mm -hmm. where we worked. And we were working with Yazidi women who um, had a really bad incidence of a medical issue in the camps that they were hoping to get medical supplies for, and they were not getting anywhere. But we taught them how to use low-cost, off-the-shelf, mobile phone-based tech, uh, Kobe, Kobo toolbox, in order to do surveys, in order to capture the data in the camps about the severity of the problem. They did that, and they immediately got the medical aid that they were, had been seeking for months. But more importantly, what we saw is that after that incident, they kept using their knowledge of the tech to do surveys for international organizations. And this then becomes kind of a revenue stream for them, a jobs program. 
It's an unintended consequence. Uh -huh. And that's what we've seen. I could give you case after case where the unintended consequence of a really smart nonprofit figuring out how to do something really important to address a problem, whether it's IPayToBribe.com you know, to tackle corruption in the world, or um, any, HALA, um, which is a great platform for countering gender violence that started in South America. These are really um, innovative tech ideas that had the unintended consequence of producing economic, producing jobs and economic development. And we just don't think hard enough about that intersection, which I got to tell you is why it is such a joy to work with C5 and Amazon Web Services on our accelerator, because this is all about finding entrepreneurs around the world in these kinds of uh, uh, difficult environments, conflict environments, that when they succeed, they produce lots of jobs. And that really is something we need to think a whole lot more about. And we can now. And I'll tell you why we can, which we couldn't do that before. It's that arrival of tech that is arrival of tech in the, where the bottom three billion live that is pushing the multinationals, the business world, to actually realize those are important markets for us. And if you look at the numbers on foreign direct investment into places like Nigeria, which has a terrible conflict, you know, Boko Haram in the north, but huge economic activity in the south, or the foreign direct investment into Burma or into any number of countries that previously were described as conflict countries. And now we're getting much more nuanced about it because we're seeing the flows of capital into mm -hmm. these places. So it really has provided us with a new opportunity to rethink this idea of public-private partnerships. I love what you were saying, Kate, about you know there are certain things government does really well, and there are certain things it really doesn't do well. And, and, and that's where, if we don't get the private sector to partner with us in peace building, we will never, ever grow that resource pie. Right. We've I, seen that over decades. Yeah, I, 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 um, I have to agree with you. It's um, creating an ecosystem. It's creating the uh, entire environment that's going to foster the, the job growth and the economic development. Uh, in uh, the UK, uh, Amazon created a program called Restart. And Restart was quite simply aimed at trying to get military leavers uh, and uh, uh, disadvantaged from the Prince's Trust to become skilled and trained in uh, cloud computing and cloud technologies so that they take those skills and in turn uh, start building new careers uh, from, from e either a disadvantaged background or from a transition. Mm -hmm. um, not specifically an economic development model, but it's part of the underpinnings that we do need to tackle in terms of trying to start the, the entire job creation process. Um, you know, I thought your story was very interesting. I wonder, Kate, um, do you have any examples uh, that, that are particularly inspiring that you want to share about um, how you saw tech create some new social good or some new tool or capability? Yeah, we've had, um, we've got lots of examples. It's like, a, it's, I, I'm not choosing any favorite children when I, when I say who, because uh, we've had 46 ventures now come through our program in three years. They've impacted over 300,000 lives around the world, raised over 16 million in funding, and created nearly 250 jobs. Uh, so I could pick so many of them, right? And some of them are not tech. They're tech-enabled. They're food or you know, any number of things. But um, maybe you know, to ping off you, Sheldon, one of the guys from the current cohort um, is called Mobilize Construction, and they work um, in sub-Saharan Africa, and the way that they use um, uh, tech is uh, to use the accelerom accelerometer on your mobile phone to determine how smooth a road is, right? And when they have that data, they record all of that data, they can send out crews of manual labor to fix the roads where it's too difficult to get you know, big, heavy machinery. They can fix roads at a rate that is four times faster than government at a uh, price point that is nine times cheaper um, using this tech-enabled 
platform that they've created. So the reason I think, Sheldon, it's, it's applicable for you is because it can also be used in post-conflict, right? I send them to... Yeah, yeah, right. they've already, they're already talking to IDB, so... Yeah. Um, but it's, uh, you know, that's a great example. And another one, just to pull out one that's uh, using AWS credits, because we have a partnership with you guys too, and we love it. I can get a renewal now, right, by saying that. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> no, they're, they're amazing partners, and, and many of our fellows treat their AWS credits like gold. Um, but a good, and a good example of that is Kaya. Uh, um, these guys are so amazing. They were actually used to be called Alex. And within two weeks of starting at Halcyon, they'd received a cease and desist letter from one of the big publishing houses. And one of the key uh, things that we look for in entrepreneurs is resilience. And the reason that we knew these guys had it was they received that letter and were like, yes, we got noticed. We have to rebrand. We're a threat. Like, they just flipped it over to be an opportunity and, and, and rebranded as Kaya. And um, they basically take all of the leftover spots in college classrooms, of which we know there are many, because colleges, you know, they're in a bubble right now. Um, and and as well as online courses. And they will map out for people that are unemployed or underemployed or just want to reskill or, or you know, increase their skill sets um, a path by maybe taking this one class over here physically or this one over here that's online or you know, these two together to get to this you know, qualification level or this certification level. Um, and it's, it comes about because they were both children of immigrants and really have watched their siblings and themselves really struggle with paying back these massive student loans and wanted to create a better pathway for the 21st century for people to upskill. Um, so that's a great example maybe of, of sort of more traditional tech. It's a, it's a great example and it also ties right back to that recovering maritime archaeology <laughs> because they remembered to breathe when they got that letter. Totally. In fact, that they managed the to turn it around. I can bring out that, was, that was beautiful. Um, well, we had a couple of questions that we thought were interesting, but let me take a pause and see if we've got some questions from the audience. Stunned. There we go. Yes, sir. I'm not particularly familiar I'm not with familiar. that program. I'm not familiar with that program, well, I, uh, but I can tell you that one of the least, uh, we have so much more that we can be doing in terms of online virtual education, virtual training, and should be doing because the research about the people's retention and also from a peace building, got to get in my peace building perspective. From a peace building perspective, the research is really powerful about how you can break down interpersonal, interethnic, interreligious barriers in a carefully facilitated online dialogue. And it's so much less costly than sending people abroad that all I can tell you is that, that we are just in the very early, early stages of seeing what we can be doing globally in using this kind of tech for it. May I, may I translate my question to sort of cloud yeah. a little bit there? Uh, so how about the mobile platform uh, as a tool uh, for leveraging development in developing countries uh, for long distance learning and then possibly also for microfinance through uh, online banking? We, we are great believers in uh, using mobile for all those applications that you've sketched. And in the, in the coding space, um, the mobile platform is terrific for, for long distance learning. And what we're seeing increasingly is um, a combination of gamification along with mobile. Uh, a, a, a great uh, startup that crossed our path uh, last year is called um, Coding Combat, which teaches children through, um, through a virtual world, a virtual adventure experience, how to do coding from a very, very small age. And um, last night at the AWS Partners Dinner at the USIP, we heard about a program that teaches um, young Kenyan high school graduates to become AWS solution archi architects from a, from a, from a high school education, educational base 
within a, a period of three to six months. So I think mobile is terrific and, and the, the level of mobile penetration in the developing world is, is just extraordinary. It's now not whether you have a mobile phone, it's what kind of mobile phone do you have and how many do you have. So um, hu huge opportunity. There's an underlying uh, challenge when you get into the education system around this is that it's mindset, it's culture, right? The nuance the, that comes from the different cultures. So when you talk about Kenya, they don't trust their, Kenyans don't trust been working in Kenya for a number of years. And so you have to like build trust. And so you have to build an entrepreneurial mindset. You have to, you have to support a culture shift to allow for uh, those people who are aspiring entrepreneurs and looking to take the different technology advances or learn the knowledge they have, but then to apply it, they have to, we have to, we have to help them understand how to behave different to be able to move to a place of success. Otherwise, we're giving them core skills, but not any of the interpersonal skills or skills that would be required to learn how to breathe um, when your body says, I'm going to die, right? And so this, this is really an important part that I think sometimes gets overlooked um, when we talk about technology is how to, how to, how to help support people to, to think and behave differently. Yeah, we do a lot of develop our development around soft skills, just to talk about that. But um, to your point, I mean, many of our fellows have come from a developing world, and most of them are building almost completely on mobile. And in that way, I think it's going to be interesting to see if businesses that are formed outside of the US do actually leapfrog us eventually, because none of them are basing it on old infrastructure. Um, so it's, I think that's going to be particularly interesting. And another uh, interesting stat that I found that's slightly related, not so much about mobile, but certainly about tech in developing world, um, the number one downloader of um, education YouTube videos, do you know what country that is? Anyone? Saudi Arabia. That, you brought, you're on the panel. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> All right, and, all, all right, right anybody so else, ahead. pretend that didn't happen. Sorry. Anybody know where the... <laughs> and, 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 and which demogra demographic in Saudi Arabia is downloading those videos? Yeah. So, I mean, talk about massive potential for a cultural shift in a few years due to technology, uh, you know. So, I, I think that this is a very interesting question with too many parts probably for us all to delve yeah. into. But. Thank you for that question, though. Do we have another one? Yes, sir. So, uh, a couple of months ago, I I think that's an interesting question. I've got maybe one or two observations, but I want to let the panel here get first crack. Well, you're the only AWS representative up here. <laughs> <laughs> Max, you stuck well, with that one. I, well, think, you, I, was, I think it was I for you, I Max. was going to give you <laughs> the opportunity to talk about examples. Um, the answer is uh, absolutely, right? The, the challenge is getting to all the places you need to fast enough. And I'll give you three quick examples. Um, the other challenge, by the way, is you do have to have the... Uh, enlightened receptivity of whichever organization you're talking to. So uh, in the UK, we're working with uh, the further education uh, group, um, which, you know, it's before I'm going on to university. So this is more like 16, 17 year olds um, and have created workshops to bring them in and through that organization start delivering uh, practical cloud computing at that age. Um, in uh, Bahrain, we worked through a different avenue. It was with uh, their um, economic development uh, and labor um, uh, agency called Temkin. Uh, and so we have worked with them to make sure that the cloud training classes that Amazon delivers are available through their uh, job training programs, which are in turn 100% reimbursed by the labor development fund. So just a different way to get there. Um, and then we make available uh, to uh, schools, uh, they could be um, uh, further education, they could be vocational education, they could be regular universities. We make online tools available. And uh, the gentleman here asked a little bit earlier about kind of online 
uh, systems and online tools. And one of them that we deliver is called AWS Educate. Um, it, it has been in operation now for three plus years. It's gotten to the point where uh, not only is it about learning and about skills development, but at the end of it, it's about jobs. Uh, and so, the, so the, uh, the pathway through AWS Educate actually includes an integrated jobs portal so that those, those organizations, they could be government, they could be nonprofits, they could be commercial industry, but those organizations who need those skills have a place to go to match with a ready pool of talent. So I, I, think, um, I think your point is uh, spot on. We need to make sure that um, whatever learning institutions are dealing with, with its, whether it's the government program, uh, educational institutions, further education, um, that, that we're offering training that is uh, relevant for, for now and for today and for the very topics that we're talking about. Yes, sir. <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> Yeah, so the, let me just see if I can restate the question. So the question is, uh, can, we, can the panel talk about different ways that they see education happening uh, in that entire spectrum, K-12? I mean, given the title of the session, economic operation, education, and the other things that you mentioned, and So the question is, for the K-12 profession, how, what are we doing or how, how do we see them uh, embracing this idea of economic development and job creation through tech? Any examples from the panel about, um, about really what it is, is um, we've got teachers, right, <clears throat> uh, that are... Th Right. Right. So, so um, I'll give the panel one more um, opportunity yeah. to think of any well, relevant examples. Go ahead. Well, I think the, the 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 good news is education is more relevant than ever, um, and we need teachers more than more than ever before. Um, the digital world requires a different model of education going forward, which I think will increasingly be a combination of a human teacher with digital uh, teaching means. But I can't foresee any scenario in which the teacher will be eliminated. And for a teacher to be relevant in terms of teaching children digital skills or, or, um, or even uh, mature adults, um, they, don't have to be, they don't have to be software coders. They just need to be digitally aware. And so, so I, I, I think um, even though there's a lot of anxiety about potential job losses, I, I can't envisage a scenario where classrooms will be run by Amazon's Alexa, for example. I think we will always have this, this human digital combination. And um, actually, many of the, of the models that we see in startups is about how do you access teachers, how do you access human teachers, how do you access and how do you find good schools? How do you find good universities? How do you find online content that you can integrate in your human teaching environment? I, I, think, um, I think it is about uh, a journey. Um, we do include with some of the AWS Educate programs um, that reach out to the teacher to help the teacher become, as Andre said, you know, so digitally savvy. Um, uh, there's, a, there's a number of different uh, teaching venues that are available out there as well. Um, but I do think it's a journey, um, and I don't think we have an answer for that one. And I would also say I don't know if the anxiety is limited to te the teaching domain, right? Like it's everyone, it's just that teachers are specifically thinking about their role in, in being able to use and teach with a technology that they may not be familiar with. But I think that everyone is anxious about it. Uh, and, uh, I'm married to a teacher, and 
all I can tell you is the impact of tech in that classroom, in her classroom, is really about her, as you were saying, her having to take on all kinds of new digital literacy skills and actually not concerned about losing a job, but concerned about keeping up with what you need to know to be effective. So um, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Andrea. The future, I think, for the, the, the human element is, uh, in teaching is very bright, though, as I said earlier, we have terrific data on the impact and the effectiveness of online education now as well. And I think it's what we see as an expanding universe and the role of education being increasingly important. I mean, education is ripe for disruption, right? The way we're teaching our K through 12 hasn't changed fundamentally, right, since the late 1800s. So it's, it's a great time to look at how do we create a more experiential-based education system where we're, we're, we're teaching relevant information and knowledge that can be applied um, much faster because kids are smarter than, than you know, uh, they were. They're getting more knowledge and information at a young age. And so keeping them challenged and not bored in school is going to be a critical component to making sure that you're a relevant teacher going forward. Um, and technology, obviously, is going to play a key role. Yeah, and there's a, a, the, the final thing to sort of close on that note, there's a tremendous number of ed techs um, that are running on Amazon that are trying to figure out those very things, right? What, what is the new, more effective teaching and delivery model? Oh, there you go. Right, I finally got to the real part of the question here. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's, it's, it's ab absolutely astounding, right, some of the things. We have uh, several different folks here. Uh, Santiana here is delivering all kinds of learning. Uh, uh, Blackboard, uh, Elucian, there's a lot of people, and I'm sorry, maybe I didn't get your company, but again, we encourage, we encourage uh, a lot of that sort of experimentation because it is a journey. But Max, can I just say, so on the educational curriculum today, you know, what we are seeing is the ability to learn the basics, reading, writing, arithmetic, Technology is really helping change the speed at which those things can be taught. Leaving more time, and I'm seeing this in, in especially in private schools in this country already, and I believe it's going to hit the public school system too eventually. It's always you know, more resource deprived. And that is how to teach social and emotional learning skills. How do we get along in increasingly crowded cities, increasingly crowded planet? How do we deal with these kinds of really key issues of the future? Um, and what's the role of education in that? So I, I work with an edutech company that is all about 2x, meaning you can learn your K through 12 in what they believe is have most of that curriculum under your belt by eighth grade, leaving more time for social and emotional learning skills, which are increasingly important in our world. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I was curious about um, what are your views on how crowdsourcing could take a role in the traditional uh, technology innovation and startup generation, particularly in developing countries where there are significant gap areas in the infrastructure needed to take technology innovation to the market? That's a very interesting question. So, how can crowdsourcing play a role in these new models for economic development? I mean, you, we're seeing businesses that are starting up and building that are using crowdsourcing as a key mechanism for, for their business model. Um, two, uh, just, just was in Mumbai and also Berlin doing um, Extreme Build a Business Weekends there. And in both cities, there was the same application, which is measuring potholes in the road and difficulty in the road and trying to repair the road. But it's all, they're all, it's all being crowd sourced in terms of how they're able to determine where those roads need to be repaired. Um, so from my perspective, those, those entrepreneurs out there that see a need are able to leverage that mobile technology to then be able to crowdsource the, the data, then to be able to resell it or find a customer who's interested in that data. And all, all I do is see an increase in, in applications for that. It's a, it's a major source of funding for many of our fellows is to, to go out to Kickstarter or whatever to, to get funding. So that's certainly one way I think that we can level the playing field around funding gaps, um, particularly for women and founders of color who are disproportionately funded. Um, 
But uh, to your point as well, I think that we see a lot of our applications coming through around using the power of the crowd and the knowledge of the crowd to create smarter cities um, in any number of yeah. applications. I mean, yeah. you name it. Yeah. And I think I think one of the things that I was thinking of when you brought up, and what's the business name again? Mobilized Construction. Mobilized construction. It's the best one out of the three we've mentioned. Um, Can we get them DC to fix it. Well, I think, I think, I think, what's a, but I think what's important about that, and as, as we look at the space around the world, is that there seem to be trends and there seem to be waves of the same business starting all over the, the world at the same exact time. Um, it's, it's a pattern I've seen over the last 10 years working just uh, with, different places around the world. And I think that the question that I have in this situation when I start seeing a trend around a certain particular app or some kind of technological application, and education's another one, that every, every week there's somebody trying to grow in business to help and innovate and disrupt education, is how, how the differentiator on which ones of those businesses will actually be successful at taking off and creating a viable business um, that, that, that can you know, survive a, a long period of time is, is something that I think is, is fascinating to, to look at and, and a really an unknown ultimately. But um, crowdsourcing is, is, is a major engine behind a lot of businesses around the world right now. I had a question right here. Okay. Yes, sir. I was wondering if you could uh, speak to sort of what the biggest challenge or barrier they sort of encountered in achieving their objectives is. I guess I'm asking from the perspective of a government representative, just like how best we can enable the work that you're trying to do and achieve. Great question. And so uh, from a government perspective, what are some of the blockers and what could government do to better enable uh, job creation and new models for economic development? I think innovation requires leadership, and one of the best um, roles that government can provide is to provide leadership, emphasizing the importance of innovation as part of the country's economic development agenda, and as part of innovation, um, cloud adoption. Cloud adoption typically adds 2 to 3 percent to the GDP growth of, um, of emerging economies, and so it is a way in, in which governments can really accelerate not only the growth of the digital part of the economy, but the economy as a whole. And, um, and so leadership is absolutely crucial, um, both at a, at, a, at a federal, state, and a local level. I think um, leveraging the power of their, their wisdom and network and expertise for you know, rapid use by entrepreneurs, either through convenings or advice, is, is really, I've seen that work really well. I would say on the flip side, you know, the, one of the ways, and I think I kind of touched on this, that a government could potentially um, and perhaps unconsciously block uh, someone's progress is, is if somebody believes that they're going to be able to get funding from a government source and it does not operate fast enough. And that's the number one way where I've seen people really get caught up and stumble within the system. In addition to the requirements once you get the grant. Oh, gosh. I, you know, from, from, a, from a government perspective and working with a lot of different governments, um, including the U.S. government, I think that it's, there's, got, there's got to be some kind of consistency. There's too much change and shifting. People's roles shift. So you've got a champion, you've got a leader. They're all about the innovation and then there's a shift and they, 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 they migrate out or it's an election, they migrate out and the next person in, uh, clean it, wipe it clean. It's not, I had nothing to do with that. I'm going to do it my way. This is how I'm going to move forward. And so there's this inconsistency within government that we call the unknowables, and we try to predict those unknowables now so we can be more effective at moving forward with our projects. But, but somehow, if within the government sector there was a way to create some kind of consistency where every two years there wasn't a change, every four years there isn't a change, that it just keeps going, I think would be far better because a lot of what's being restarted in a lot of different places, and even here right now in the U.S., is replicating what was already started before. It's just got a new name, and now we're starting from scratch, and all the people who have this institutional knowledge are now removed. Let's get new people in. It, it just it slows down. It, what it, all of a sudden, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not helping advance things. It's, 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 it's deterring the momentum that would be built and has been built in many cases from continuing on. And so that would be one of the things, and I have no idea how to, how to make that happen, but, but that, is, that is a consistent 
battle and challenge that we face is change in government? I, I think we've seen government in the last, really across the last five to 10 years, really trying to be more innovative, really trying to be more agile, really trying to be less risk averse, as you were talking, speaking earlier, Kate. And I honestly think that we, civil society, private sector, have an obligation to recognize that there is only so much government can do if they are playing with the taxpayers' dollars and in terms of taking risks. And that we've got to figure out better ways of using those private sector partnerships Bring, making sure that the private sector is invested in the things, which is, again, as I said, this is why it's been such a pleasure to work with C5 and Amazon Web Services on our accelerator, because they are taking the risks that we could not have taken at the U.S. Institute of Peace, because it's a taxpayer-funded institution. And they're able to be true partners in, in, in bringing expertise, capital to bear on what is by definition risky. It's the startup world, folks. And that's just going to, we need to really, there's things that we all do well. And nurturing, cultivating startups is not one I would say is a really big business for the government to be in. There's, there's just two other real quick ones. One is, <clears throat> it doesn't necessarily have to be about all the programs. Uh, adopt an open data initiative. Free up the data the government has and then see what uh, industry and what people and what entrepreneurs can do with it. There's a lot of great examples of that as a tool for innovation, and it's a win-win. Uh, the other one is interesting opportunities for government to use the power of the purse. Uh, in the UK, they created a contract for uh, cloud computing, uh, and one of the objectives they had was to increase the amount of small and medium enterprise being able to uh, deliver on government contracts. Uh, earlier this morning, actually right in this very room, uh, the UK CTO uh, explained how they've achieved now 53% of the purchases off of that government contract for cloud computing, cloud services, come now from uh, small and medium enterprises in the form of consulting and other services. So those are some different ways that government can use the power of the purse. Uh, you all have been a great audience. We're at the end here. I thought I would do a speed round as a wrap up for each of our uh, panelists. Um, some of the examples you gave were incredible. They were very inspiring. I thought I would wrap up based on this gentleman's question with um, maybe one example that you've had where you've really had a great partnership with government uh, and, and you know, what, what made it a great partnership? <laughs> was that a, I want to answer it or was that a no. call on somebody else? No, I want to answer it because I've had a great partnership with government. They spun us out. There you go. <laughs> We were created, the Peace Tech Lab was spun out. Again, this is that what, where we've seen government being more innovative, right? Bureaucracies tend to clutch things that are working very close instead of giving them the support to really scale. And you've got to give it to United States Institute of Peace. They spun out the Peace Tech Lab in an entrepreneurial fashion. And so, yeah, this has been a great public-private partnership. So there's one great model with a supporter who's incredibly enthusiastic, all right? So John? I, I think that it's, for, for, for Griffin Works, it's really working with some of the embassies within the, the different countries where those partnerships have led to actual entrepreneurship summits that are taking place that are in partnership with, uh, for instance, women entrepreneurship centers we're running where they get very enthusiastic and then bring the connections and the influence that they have to be able to produce a better event. And, we found that, the, that, that when it's localized, you can, you can create a stronger kind of connection and um, collaboration with different governments. And, and then also the, the actual country government gets more involved at that point too. And so those, those have been good examples for us that, that are fruitful. And is that how the extreme build a business model works? Well, that, that's, a, that's not, sometimes it, it's tied to that, but it's also tied to a longer term seven month acceleration program or like we did with um, AWS in Costa Rica, it was, it was a two day event and uh, helping them build their business and moving forward. Um, but in, in, the, in the one that I was uh, using, which would be in Zambia, it was actually tied to a We Create Women's Entrepreneurship Community Center and then partnering with the Zambian government to produce 
uh, a two-day uh, summit around how to grow Zambia's entrepreneurial ecosystem, which has a strong innovation uh, and entrepreneurship drive within the government. Good example. Kate? Um, I'll do two quick ones, one from uh, Halcyon overall and one from a fellow. Um, a fellow that comes to mind, Deanna, was actually working on uh, creating different products. She was an industrial designer, different products to empower women in the developing world, particularly focused in Africa. She'd done a pilot, successful pilot in Uganda, and USAID came in and funded three different pilots in other parts of Africa so that she could test her model in, within different cultural spheres. Um, and that was, that was a great way for the government to come in and quickly apply some funding and, and get her to scale. Um, one example from Halcyon was when we were starting out, um, we didn't have a network to publicize this amazing opportunity where you get to come live in this amazing house in Georgetown for free, get $10,000 a mentor, all of these business and legal support services and um, you know, all of this fantastic stuff. Um, we're now at the point where we get 300 applications for every eight spots and I will credit very much the State Department for pushing out that opportunity to its many, many networks. But this was one of the times where we had to really carefully make sure we were connected with multiple nodes within that you know, government entity, because otherwise it would not have worked. Just one person can't carry you. Yeah, not easy, but you found the key. Yep. Andre? Uh, we have a startup in our uh, Bahrain Scalarator, which helps um, GCC nationals, so a national from the, from the Middle East region, find jobs. And most of the governments in that region have, have started a program to employ local people. And this platform, which is an Arabic version of LinkedIn, um, has really enabled governments to um, uh, support the employment and the skilling of local people. And that's been a great success. Thank you very much. Great answers, great questions from the audience. Thank you so much. And I hope this inspires you to go and take action. If you're in government, please think about how you can use a public-private partnership and the power of government to help create uh, new jobs and economic development and peace and prosperity. Thank you.